It's a bit sad to say, but we've reached the final section of the video course. As a brief recap, we can think back to how much we've learned and realize the magnitude of content covered in these eight sections so far. We started with the basics of JavaScript and how the D3 library API is built on top of it. We learned about using D3 not only for HTML elements, but also for creating SVG elements. We built a robust scatter plot that queried an externally hosted API for data and added user interface elements. We also learned the importance of animation in interactive visualizations, and most recently, we applied our knowledge of building reusable charts to creating an interactive choropleth with zoom behavior and UI elements to update the data. So in this final section, we'll combine everything we've learned so far to create a novel visualization, what we'll call a geoscatter. Think of it as a combination of our scatter plot from a few sections back with our geomap so that instead of using circles to represent a country, we'll actually use the shape of the country in our chart. We'll start with the code from the last video of the previous section. We'll rearrange the HTML and CSS a bit to accommodate the new controls we'll have, such as both an X and Y axis controller. Next, we'll go into our JavaScript and revisit our UI element handlers. We'll utilize a new library called QJS, also maintained by Mike Bostock, the creator of D3, to enable us to dynamically create a queue of AJAX requests, all with a single callback function called on completion. Finally, we'll add some logic to merge our export data with our geographic data. As stated, we'll start with our code from the previous section and build upon it. Let's make some quick stylistic changes. We'll create a left side column. Let's call it controls and have our visualization, viz, live on the right. Within our controls div, we want to create two UI sections one for our y-axis and the other for our x-axis. Because these both have similar controls coming over from our previous visualization, we'll need to distinguish them by changing IDs of year, timeline, and products to be the classes of each, but with a parent div of y and x respectively to maintain uniqueness. In the CSS, we'll set our controls and viz divs to float left and specify their widths. We'll set our year and slider next to each other as well. If we were to load the page in our browser, not everything would work properly, but we would get a sense of our visualization's new layout. So let's turn to our global map object and update the variables that our UI elements will be updating when they are changed. First of all, we changed our visualization's width in our CSS, so we need to change our map's canvas width to reflect that. The height should be reduced appropriately as well. Our product and year values will now be objects in and of themselves with X and Y key value pairs. We'll also add a new key called updated, so we'll know if the user updated the X or Y variable. The map's year and product initialization will now have to be broken up to cover their respective X and Y subvalues. The respective controls themselves also need to align with the new global map variables after initialization. Then we have to reflect these changes in our UI event listeners. We also have to change their D3 selection to use classes instead of IDs. Since both our X and Y timeline sliders use the same event listener, we'll need to determine which axis the user wishes to update. As we had planned before, we'll access this via the parent node's ID. We'll also explicitly set our timeline and text to the current year. Finally, we'll initialize the X and Y selected product values after the product options are populated. Updating our currently selected product when one is selected follows the same modifications as the timeline change handler. Now if we refresh our page, we'll notice that our page is still getting an error. If we look closely, it is due to the fact that we're trying to set the data API URL to use the map.product and map.year variables, which are now objects instead of values. 
but this doesn't matter for now. We're just concerned with the UI functionality. And that part works. The product list is being populated, and changing the year and product sets our permalink URL hash properly. We won't worry about repairing our data API quite yet, since we're going to change how we're making AJAX requests soon. It's now time for a short detour into how to handle those AJAX requests. The QJS is a small library to help us maintain our AJAX requests using logic to determine if they need to be requested. When the page is loaded, we'll obviously need to make all the requests. But as the user changes their selections for the specific AJAX, we'll only need to fetch that specific data and not all requests. This problem arises because AJAX requests are asynchronous. For our visualization to be drawn, we need to wait until they've completed. The Q API is quite simple. We can view the documentation from the GitHub page. Basically, the two functions we need are defer and await all. Defer takes the D3 data fetching function, such as D3.json, as its first parameter. The second parameter is the URL of the data to fetch. Q's await all function then accepts the callback function from the D3 data fetching function, an instance called for each returned asynchronous task. We'll need to include this library before anything. So in the document's head, let's insert the d3.js org hosted version of the file. Now we'll make our JSON requests using the Q API. Well, actually we won't worry about our HS requests for our dropdowns, since the execution of this callback does not depend on any other requests. But the rest of our data calls, one for geography, one for the x-axis, and one for the y-axis, will depend on each other's completion, so we'll queue them. Let's create a new function called updateData to be called any time a user element changes. Each request will only be added to the queue if it needs to be. The geography will only be fetched on page load, and the axis data requests will only happen if something is updated. Finally, remove the JSON fetch of the topo JSON toward the start of the init file. Instead, call update data at the end of the init function to get it all started. Now we need to update our draw map function. First of all, the queue's callback will call draw map with the error and data parameters. Where data is an array of the results from the 1, 2, or 3 requests. With that, we'll next need to comment out the entire body that we have and add logic that checks which requests were made and thus which data has been fetched. If the length of the returned array is 3, then obviously this is in init and all requests were made. If there are two items returned, this means that the data contains only y and x-axis data in that order. The case in which one item is being returned is a bit more complicated, since it entails knowing which axis was updated. Since either map.update.x or map.update.y will be true, we can simply use this and reset both back to false afterwards. Because we're going to need to persist our data over multiple calls, the data object in our map is also going to have to be initialized at the top. Let's initialize data's x and y to be empty arrays to start. Finally, armed with our data, we would like to filter our list of countries to only the ones with data for both axes. We can do this by using the JavaScript filter function on our array of countries. We'll first determine the lowercase id of the country and use this to filter both our x-axis and y-axis data arrays to find the current country. We'll then check if both data arrays have a length larger than zero. If they do, we'll set this country's export data to an object with this country's x-axis and y-axis data. A return value of true from filter means that the data is not filtered out. When we run this in our browser, we can check that it is working by noticing that the first number, the total number of countries, is larger than the second number, the filtered number of countries. We've now completed a lot of the initial groundwork and planning for our geoscatter visualization. 
In the next video, we'll look at some of the intricacies with drawing our country shapes at specific XY coordinates instead of the ones specified in the GeoJSON file we are loading.